think the stories we tell ourselves are either about our own failings or they're about other people's mega achievements. And we distort both. Another pattern that I see a lot is women who have changed careers or jobs more frequently, feeling like maybe they're dilettantes or they're lacking depth, right? They get this phrase that gets used, jack of all trades. And one thing that I use to reframe that a little bit is that the full quote, which is attributed to Shakespeare, is a jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Generation Exceptional podcast with me, Bev Thurgood. I'm joined today by Rachel Gaddis. Now, Rachel reached out to me by email because uh, I think, if I remember rightly, had you seen my TED Talk maybe? I found mean, your podcast and listened to some episodes of that. That's how I found you. Got you. <laughs> and, and I got this lovely email saying, I think I might be your US twin. So we <laughs> midlife women. ADHD, late diagnosed. Uh, Rachel is a career coach focused particularly on helping midlife women who have a, a late diagnosis of ADHD or neurodivergence to re refocus their career. I'm really fascinated to dive into why, um, you know, what got you to helping women in this sort of stage of their lives. So Rachel, welcome to the show and just spend a minute or two telling us a little bit about you and your own journey to what got you where you are now. Yes, it, I'm so excited to be here uh, with my UK twin. It's so great. Uh, yes, so I, I was, as Bev said, late diagnosed with ADHD at 44. Um, and I had already, uh, by that point, uh, kind of reached, you know, uh, midlife, right, at, at my mid-40s. And I'm turning 50 later this year. Uh, and by now, I've been through, you know, the COVID pandemic with everybody. Uh, during COVID, I was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, and went through treatment for that. And, you know, there were just a few key turning points, right, around like very close together. I lost someone close to me who was around my age and that hit me pretty hard. So all of these things, right, bam, 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 kind of made me feel like, wow, life is so short and you have to kind of uh, make the most of it while you have it. And then with my ADHD as well, I just, I remember having this very surreal experience on a conference call, actually, the day I got my breast cancer diagnosis. And I was thinking, I don't, you know, everything was kind of happening around me. And I was thinking, I don't care about any of this. Like, why am I spending my life doing this kind of thing when I really want to be somewhere else? Uh, so I vowed right then that once I was done with treatment, I would, you know, work really hard to change my my career right into what I wanted it to be. And I thought uh, I thought then that what I would do is focus my coaching practice around women who were returning to work or returning to their careers after an absence, right? Like after uh, taking care of their families or after an illness or something like that. But as I started actually doing my coaching practice, it kind of started to shift, right? As, as our work kind of does, as it starts to come to us. And I realized there are so many women out there like me who were diagnosed late with ADHD and whose lives started to kind of look different as they started to grapple with that diagnosis. Uh, and yeah, so that's how I came to be here, kind of working primarily with women who uh, are in the situation I was in when I was late diagnosed. Yeah. So I was later than you. I was 56 when I got my diagnosis. Yeah. The, the strange thing is I'd made the shift away from my career and into self-employment a few years before I was diagnosed. And I feel like had I not made that shift, I don't know that the diagnosis or the, the recognition of the neurodivergence would have necessarily showed up. I think it was being exposed to a different environment that, that made the made the the traits of ADHD sort of amplify. Um, so 
when you're when you're working with women, do you find that they've already made that shift and now they're floundering, or do you find that they're they're recognizing that they've had the diagnosis? They're stuck in a a role that maybe is a bit of a square peg and a round hole for them, and they're looking to make a change. What what do you find sort of um, is is the norm? It's such a good question, and it's kind of a little bit of a mix. You know, some of the women I work with, they actually have an ADHD diagnosis, and so, uh, but those are the exception. Most of the women that I work with, they are experiencing ADHD symptoms. They feel like they might be ADHD, but they're not working with an official diagnosis. They just feel that friction between their neurodivergence, the environment that they're working in, the way that they're working in that environment. So there's kind of something there that we need to sort of address to make it a little easier. Um, And sometimes I'm working with women who they just feel this mismatch in their lives, maybe between the ADHD and the the work or just between uh, their values and their work. Like there's just like this miasma of things that isn't quite meshing and their ADHD symptoms are only a part of it and maybe it's not even recognized yet. So I'm not necessarily explicitly working with them for ADHD. It's just a small part of a bigger picture. I think it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because when you're talking about women hitting midlife, ADHD or not, we have a whole load of stuff going on. We have physical changes happening. We have life stage changes happening. You know, often if we've had a family, the family are moving out. So there are identity issues cropping up. I think yeah. we we often find that, uh, you know, perimenopause kicks in and that creates a whole load of change. And so ADHD or not, I think it's a turbulent time for a lot of women, often when we get to this age, we're starting to maybe see friends or family um, being taken from us, and that can have an impact on our own sense of mortality. And I think there's this, as you say, this sort of melting pot almost of things changing and happening that right. are stirring up the pot. So yeah. what are, what are the challenges that you see most when it comes to making these sort of Uh, career shifts or life shifts in midlife? Yeah, so many of them are things that we ourselves, uh, you know, limiting beliefs that we ourselves are carrying with us that we don't even realize we are. And I'm sure you've seen this a ton in your own work where it's something that we don't even realize we've been carrying with us since, you know, early childhood, maybe, or since early in our lives where we, it's an unexamined belief that we just always kind of felt to be true based on what we saw around us or what we heard around us. So until uh, we're kind of forced to say it out loud to someone and kind of drag it out into the light and examine it and look at it, uh, we just, uh, we're just kind of building our lives around these assumptions. And some of those can be things like, uh, well, um, it's selfish to look for work that I really enjoy, right? Or if I enjoy my work, then it's not really work, then it's not really serious. You know, work has to be serious. It can't be something I like. Uh, And that sounds silly when I say it out loud. And yet it's something a lot of us really believe that you have to be suffering to be working. or, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just so many things like that. I could go on and on. But yeah, so so deeply held limiting beliefs. I mean, that's a big, that's a big one. Um, I think this is a big one as well for those of us that are neurodivergent, because chances are we've spent our whole life trying to mask what our own perceived exactly. failings and you know when we get to that that midlife point however you define that and we start to find the confidence to let the mask go and i think there's been a whole load of social media stuff you know adhd tiktok and all of this kind of um messaging that actually i think has made it much easier for us now to self identify as adhd i do have a formal yeah. diagnosis 
But in yeah. reality, I'm not sure we need that psychiatrist or psychologist tick in the box for us to know that we, you know, we we've been masking traits that have felt unacceptable um, to to show up with in in society. So, I yeah. think you know, so I, I I'm all for not necessarily self diagnosis, but self identifying with many of the the neurodivergent traits I think we know ourselves well enough but I totally get these the limiting beliefs that we you know we we can't do things or it's going to be harder for us or it's going you know people are going to judge us negatively if we do yeah. things that you know um step out of that that masked box that we've been in so mm -hmm. what sort of um i'm really fascinated to know the sorts of changes that that you you see in your work are they career changes are they like tiny little pivots or are they massive mm -hmm. whole life changes are we talking changing jobs or literally walking away from sort of the corporate world and into self-employment or is it a mix of all of the above? Well, it's a mix. I've had a surprising number of clients uh, completely break from their traditional, you know, more corporate work and go to something completely different. You know, not because that was the demand of their neurodivergent personalities or what I do particularly in my practice, but because as we started to work together to find out, okay, what's really important to you? What is it that you want to do? What is it that you feel a pull to do? That It turned out that they already had something that they wanted to do. And they pictured it very clearly and had been thinking about it for a long time. Uh, they just hadn't had the, they hadn't felt like they could say it out loud before. They kind of needed a safe space to be able to say it. Uh, and a great example of this that I just love is um, one of my early clients who had been working as an executive director of a nonprofit. And she uh, decided to, she had been unhappy in her work for a long time. She had undiagnosed at the time ADHD. So she was experiencing a lot of symptoms, but didn't really know what they were, you know, yet. And uh, so she knew she wanted to leave her job. She just didn't know what she wanted to do yet instead. And she didn't want to leave until she knew what she wanted to leave it for. Uh, and so in our work together, she decided, she realized that she wanted to do something creative, something more creative, and that started to take shape as to what it would look like. And ultimately, she decided to create her own perfumes, her own like small batch uh, perfumes at home. And she ended up starting her own business to sell these fragrances online. And she's now running a thriving business doing exactly that. She has employees, she has office space, she has... Uh, everything. Um, and that's been very rewarding to see. She's so happy. She's been very happy ever since she did it. Was it hard? Yes. Uh, was she up for it? Absolutely. It's been so rewarding for her. So that's a great example that I love. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think this is the challenge that a lot of, a lot of us have when we make that jump is that it's going to be hard. But for me, there's nothing harder than being a square peg in a round hole in a job that you're not aligned to um, either because that's not aligning with your skill set or your values so actually yes you know as a as a, a midlife woman who made the change from a you know a, an employed career into a self-employed career six and a half years mm -hmm. ago is it has it been easier for me being self-employed? Hell no. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> definitely not. Um, you know, I had job security. I was a civil servant. I had, um, you know, a very, a, a pretty much the most stable and safe and secure job you can get. It, n no jobs are ever safe and secure. But yeah. it was also intensely boring a lot of the time the people weren't but the work was and it, it didn't ever really fill me with this sense of uh, uh, like having any kind of um, job satisfaction really from it whereas yeah. now working for myself 
whoa, it's harder. You know, having the 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 challenges of having not necessarily having a steady income certainly not in the early days you know not knowing where the next client was going to come from having to learn all of the new stuff especially as an older woman in my in our 50s we tend to think we can't learn new things that's another and, limiting belief yeah 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 100 percent. so you know what are the challenges um there's limiting beliefs what 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 do you see coming up over and over again and more importantly how do we reframe them yeah oh man reframing is one of my favorite things to do with my clients and i'm sure it's one of yours too um well you know one of the things we've kind of touched on but not explicitly stated right so far is that for for neurodivergent people, and and I think ADHD women in particular, masking, trying to pass ourselves off as neurotypical for all of our lives up until the point when we're late diagnosed, it is exhausting. We are exhausted. We're so tired. Um, but we didn't know that that's one of the things that was making us so tired. And we're so accustomed to trying to do it. You know, we're so accustomed to thinking that we are supposed to be like that person over there or like this person over here. You know, we're trying to measure ourselves up to a certain bar that aligns with all of that neurotypical you know, measurements. So that's a big thing that, you know, call it a limiting belief, call it a, you know, mindset shift, call it whatever, but it's a big thing that we have to shift about ourselves when we're late diagnosed. It's a wonderful thing to change about ourselves, but it's also a hard habit to break that, that impulse to blend in with, with neurotypicals and try to be just like, you know, those wh whatever person it is that you've been holding up is your own personal standard <laughs> of measurement. Um, so that's one of those things that, uh, and, you know, as far as reframings, you know, it's, it's something that you have to learn to be really honest with yourself about what are some of those thoughts that you have? How do you talk to yourself? And what kinds of things are you going to say to yourself instead? Like um, a great example of reframing that I use with my clients is, um, you know, instead of saying, uh, instead of talking about how much you dread um, having to do this thing, instead of talking about having to do something, you talk about getting to do something, you know, because you're, because it is your choice, because it is something that you're excited about you know, um, and, and picking the things that you're looking forward to, uh, picking those things out of the big pile so that you choose, so that you're making more choices, more intentional choices about how you spend your time and what you spend your mental energy on. Um, that's a big part of the reframing. I don't know if I explained that very well, but mm, uh, yeah. Yeah. What about you? I think I think in terms of reframing, I, I, one of the, the questions I always get my clients to ask is, "What is the story you're telling yourself here?" Yeah. Um, because quite often the story that we're telling isn't based in any truth or any real evidence, uh, and a lot of the time, I think the stories we tell ourselves are either about our own failings or they're about other people's mega achievements. And we distort both. We we see what other people are achieving and it seems much bigger than it probably really is. We we almost pe pedestalize. I don't even know if that's a word. I might have just made that up. We put, people, we, we put people on a pedestal because we don't know what's behind the the image that we see. So I think in, you're in, missing all of that iceberg under the water yes, that represents 100%. the challenges, the failures, the struggles. Yeah. So in in sort of asking what's the story I'm telling myself, um, because all of everything in life is a story we tell ourselves because most of the time we do not know what's underneath that iceberg, you know, that tip of the iceberg, as you've just said. Um, so reframing the what am I, what's the story I'm telling myself about that person into, well, she looks like she's got it all together, but, you know, she's just a normal human being and she will still have all the fears and all of the insecurities that I have. 
So rather than placing her on a pedestal, how about I just look and take inspiration from where she's at? That for me is yeah. a big reframe from the external. From the internal, what is the story I'm telling myself about myself? I I think it's about looking for evidence and truth that what we're saying about ourselves is true. Because I know, you know, I, I've always, always the limiting belief for me is I'm not I'm not smart enough because I didn't go to university or, or college, I think. Is it college that you call it? You have high school. Yeah, and college. It is, yeah. it is college, we have yeah. college and university, uh, yeah. but I didn't get I didn't get a degree for after leaving school. I did get a degree, but not until I was into my late forties. So I'd always had this: I'm not smart enough, mm. and yeah, you know, that was the story I was telling myself: I can't do this. Yeah. I'm not smart enough. I can't go for the promotion. I'm not smart enough. And when you start to look at the evidence think well actually I've done this and I've done that and yeah. I've you know I, I the evidence doesn't back up the story so that that's my reframe I don't know I've kind of commandeered the whole conversation let's get back over no 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 I love itself. all of this I think they're great and as you were as you were talking about this I was thinking of a few more too like one of the ones I like to use with my clients is uh you know what would what would you say to yourself as a friend to yourself. That's another one I like to use that, you know, because a lot of my clients, they are great caring friends and great caring siblings, right? They would never mm -hmm. talk to a friend or a sibling the way that they talk to themselves. So that's one reframing I offer sometimes just to shift the perspective. And another one I use that can be very effective is to say, um, what would you, what would you want to do today? for your future self, your future self that's like two years from now, you know, six months from now. Because sometimes just that small layer of separation between the current them and the future them, their hopes, right, for their future self can allow them a little bit of distance so that they can say, oh, well, I guess what I want my, what my future self wants my past self to do, right, is this and that. And that can give them a little bit of like, distance to where they're not bashing themselves they're not like being too hopeful they're sort of like able to be a little objective yeah I think there's um there's a tool in NLP uh neuro-linguistic programming where um you, you you step outside and take a different perceptual position so you kind yes. of look at the the situation almost through an external lens and almost looking at yourself in that situation but you look yeah. at it objectively without the emotion and you know it's it's not easy to do but if you can if you can crack that that makes a, a huge difference to to how we perceive ourselves so i'm really interested say again sorry oh i just said that's so fascinating yeah so when one of the things that I think we often miss as we get older is how much accumulated knowledge, wisdom, experience we 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 built up in our career, and I think sometimes we forget when we're making the shift to do something different. It feels yeah. like it's a, a new start because we're starting with something new and different, but we forget that we've got all of this, you know, these suitcases full of experience and knowledge that we can take with us into the new direction. How does that, you know, do, do you resonate with that in terms of you know, the, the, the women that you work with? Do you find that they don't recognize their own um, skills Very and experience? Much. Yes. Um, you know, some of the patterns that I see are, uh, you know, fear of having to start at the bottom, you know, if they make a career change. Um, and another pattern I see, you know, because because you're not recognizing that, right? like you said, you're bringing all of this lifetime experience and expertise with you wherever you go, right? You don't leave it behind when you change careers. And then another pattern that I see a lot is, uh, is women who have changed careers or jobs more frequently, which is something that you see a lot with ADHD people, uh, and I certainly did it, uh, feeling like maybe they're dilettantes or they're uh, lacking depth, right? They're, they're not having as much deep knowledge. 
uh, they get they get this uh, phrase that gets used kind of pejoratively, jack of all trades, you know. And one thing that I use to kind of reframe that a little bit is this uh, thing that I found out not too long ago, actually, which is that the full quote, uh, which is attributed to Shakespeare, is a jack of all trades, uh, master of none. Let me let me see if I can find the, the right one because I'm not good at getting quotes correct. A jack of all trades is a master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. Yeah, yeah. We forget that whole that whole um, back end of that phrase, don't we? Yeah. I think being a jack of all trades is a real asset. I don't see it as a... I do a, too. A I do too. But the world doesn't always, right? And a lot of times we come in to these... Um, you know, women who come to see me, they're still grappling with all this baggage, right, that everyone else has been telling them their whole lives. So little little things like this, you know, and that little nuggets I can give them that help to sort of uh, dust all of that off, right, can be helpful. It's in, so interesting, uh, this, this whole sort of Gen X, Generation X period in life. Um, mm -hmm. My... YouTube channel is I've just renamed it to match my podcast which is Generation Exceptional don't know why it took me so long but what <laughs> I'm finding is there's this amazing Gen X community within YouTube of Gen Xers who are trying something new in later life and they you know they're using YouTube as the vehicle to give them a, a platform to share their knowledge and their wisdom. And I just think it blows my mind that we've got this wonderful community growing. And, I, you know, I think the Generation X, it, it, it's had such a bad bad rap over the last few you know <laughs> over the over the life of it you know we, we've been seen as the the lost generation or the missed generation where we're seen as very staid and you know very safe and I think it this there's a, a bit of a movement around the whole Gen X thing or maybe I'm just seeing it because I'm in it I don't know but I feel as if there's a movement around people yeah. feeling more comfortable to step into who they truly are and you know you look at um the the business world and gen x business owners people starting their new enterprises in you know in later life in midlife are doing better they're they're lasting longer in business they're having greater business success and yet we have this same sort of ageism that unfortunately yeah. I, I think still does exist so not only is it harder if you're a woman but it's much harder if you're an older woman in the workplace um yeah. how how do you how do you coach your clients who maybe feel that they're reaching an age where they're a bit you know going to be seen as over the hill or you know coming to the end of their their value um, yeah. rather than the start of a, a new chapter of value. Yeah, it's a it's a real thing. I mean, the first thing is, you know, when I work with them, I I don't shy away from the fact that that is real. It's a real thing. It's a real perception problem. Uh, we, you know, we work on their profiles and their personal branding with that in mind. So, you know, we're not posting things like graduation dates or your entire job history, right? We don't want to invite people to calculate your age based on what we post. Uh, but the other thing is we leverage the strengths that you have as a result of your age, all of that experience, all of that network. You know, I remind these women that they have things that somebody who's 25 or 30 doesn't have. You know, you have worked at a million different jobs. You do have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people in your network that someone who's 30 has not had the time to accumulate. You have got battle scars that inform, you know, your perspective and your knowledge of how the world operates. And you can use all of this. Right. So I remind them of the assets they have that that, yeah, you know, you're going to have to counter some. Uh, some ageism, but you've countered sexism before, you've countered all of these other things before, depending on your uh, background and what industry you've worked in. And you can counter this too. It's not something you haven't dealt with before. 
through that process of, okay, what are my strengths? You know, what am I, what do I excel at? What am I good at? Most of us, and I think it's probably more true of women, but I don't want to be um, too, you know, sexist about this. But I do think women find it harder to identify their strengths, which is why having a good coach obviously uh, is, is, is so invaluable. Yeah, but, or you know, someone, right? Someone who can be outside a little bit objective, right? Yeah, because I, I always say you can't read the label from inside the jar and sometimes you need somebody there to help you to kind of look inside and see, you know, pull out those those nuggets of of amazingness that I think we all have but yeah just a simple you know four box four boxes on a bit of paper with strengths and not to shy away from the weaknesses and I think this is a big thing that I've learned to um almost embrace is this idea of I have weaknesses and I don't have to be ashamed of them because I've spent a whole lifetime trying to hide them trying to mask them, trying yeah. to um, almost work on the weaknesses to the detriment of my strengths, which doesn't make sense in any, you know, in, in any way. Surely if you've got strengths, you play to your strengths. You don't spend endless hours trying to bring up weaknesses that actually with, you know, most of the time, if you align your career or you align your your business with your strengths, you can outsource or get help with the the other bits. Mm-hmm. Um, and do you find that the, the people you work with or the women you work with tend to be weakness focused? Um, yeah, weakness focused or um, or you know past criticism focused. You know, they still have these past. Uh, criticisms ringing in their ears, right, that are kind of deafening them to uh, anything good that's been said. It's like there can be this much good and then this much negative that was said, and yet this is like all they can hear. And there's this thing that I that I learned about when I was diagnosed with ADHD, rejection-sensitive dysphoria, RSD, mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something I, I very much see in some of my undiagnosed ADHD women. Um, and that that definitely affects, you know, something, an outlook like a SWOT analysis, right? Yeah, yeah. I do think if you can, again, it comes back to reframing, but if you can reframe those, the, those weak areas rather than um, being failings, more as being, okay, well, I've got, you know, especially if we're in midlife, I've got through 45, 55, 65 years exactly. with those with those flaws and I'm still okay and I'm still here and I'm still exactly. you know, surviving and thriving. Maybe they're not that big a deal. Maybe right. it's time right. to just put them to one side, outsource if need be, or, you know, just get support and help with them and focus on what we're brilliant at which yeah. is going to feed back into the mindset around the, those sort of positive reinforcements of we're all right. We're good. Yeah. We can do yeah. this. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's funny that you talk about playing to your strengths, right? Because as I reached a point in my career where I realized that I hadn't been playing to my strengths Bev, for most of my career, what I had been doing was shoring up my weaknesses mm. because I was so focused on my weaknesses and making sure that I was well balanced, whatever that means, right? That I was trying to think, okay, well, if I'm good at that, I don't need to do more of that. What I need to do is more of this thing that I'm bad at and don't enjoy so that I'll be better at it. So I was spending my whole career doing things I didn't really like uh, and spending time and in, in work that I didn't really enjoy. And why? Why would anyone do that? You know, but I would. But if you think about the the general sort of career path that we have, generally we be, we're being you know, we have our appraisals and most of the time the appraisals pick up on the things we need to get better at. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember many appraisal um, interviews where it's been completely focused on the things I did well 
and getting me to do more of them. It's been yeah. a pat on the back. Oh, that was great. Now can we talk about, you know, mm-hmm. the, right. you know, the, 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 the bit, there. Okay, well, let's get to the meat of it. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And I think that's one of the things that I love most about working for myself now is, hey, I don't have to have those bloody awful appraisal oh, they're terrible. Um, interviews. <laughs> but also, you know, I can play to my strengths now. Um, and it has been challenging because if if anything, working for myself has definitely um, shone a light on those weaker areas, mm-hmm. without a doubt. Things like managing my own finances, being you know on top of the numbers, they're not. It's not my forte. I don't enjoy it. I really struggle just to get the the work done. If I'm honest, I have a great bookkeeper and a great accountant now, and I, I you know so I outsourced it. It's a weakness. I don't have to deal with right. but it's definitely been um it, it's definitely shone a light on those weaknesses which is why I'm all for now recognizing them I'll try that again recognizing them owning them and not letting the the weaknesses define me so I'd love to know what would be your top three bits of advice for um someone who's maybe on the fence about whether or not they make it need to make a change in midlife they've maybe just recently been diagnosed or they're very certain that they they are neurodivergent and they're they're kind of sitting on the fence having a a, 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 you know getting splinters in their bum wondering what to do what would be (laughs) your best three bits of advice for them yeah I think that what first what I would tell them to do is really think about what's most important to you you know, in terms of uh, your own personal principles, your own personal values, and look around at where you are, you know, whether it's your industry, your career, your employer, and think about what what is most valued by them, you know, and look at that, uh, how, how well those mesh together or don't, you know, because a lot of times what I found with my own clients and with me is that where there's a mismatch with us, that's where a lot of the friction and discomfort comes in. It can cause a lot of pain. So take a close look at that and see, you know, are you, do you, are the same things important to you or is it more like an antithesis thing or is it just kind of a mismatch? Because that's, that's just number one, right? That's the number one thing. I'm and and just going to interrupt you before you do number yeah. two, because I've just had a little bit of a, an, a light bulb moment with what you've just yeah. said around mismatches and values. And I think one of the things that I realized was a mismatch for me from my career with, within the public sector was I think individualism is a massive value for me, being who you are, being true to yourself. Yeah. Um, and of course, in a in a public sector organization where there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of structure, it's actually really hard for that individualism to come out. I worked um, predominantly for the Royal Air Force. So we're talking about a uniformed organization where wow. individuality is I can't you know, imagine. really limited. So I, I've just had this real sort of light bulb moment around oh, wow, yeah, well, of course that would make sense. If individualism yeah. is a, a big value and being true to yourself and I'm working in an environment where individualism isn't um, promoted, of course it's going to be fact, a It's the opposite there, right? Yeah. It's the group over the individual. So it's exactly. almost like an anti-value in that organization. Love that. So, so values and making sure they match. Mm-hmm. What would your number two be? My number two would be what what energizes you, right? It, a lot of times people ask what you're interested in, and that's sometimes that's hard to answer because, and especially for those of us with ADHD, because we're interested in everything and our interests change a lot. So I would say what gives you energy, right? What gives you energy and what saps your energy? What do you feel charged up after doing and what do you have to recharge after doing? Um, So think about that and then think about what your job, your career, your employer is asking of you, you know, like, do you feel charged up after doing those things? Do you feel like you need to be recharged after doing those things? Like, where is that percentage, right? If 90% of the work you have to do is charging you up, that's great. That's a good sign. If 90% of it is leaving you kind of drained and having to recharge all the time, that may not be sustainable. So that's number two. So number one is values. Number two is what recharges you. Um, 
And number three is a little bit more uh, ephemeral, maybe, but it has to do with uh, thinking about your future self, right? I, I talked about this a few minutes ago, but I would say how how would you be your best friend to your future self? Like if you put yourself in the future and you think about what you would be wanting from your past self at this point, um, what might that be? And that might be anything, right? That might be for your past self to be, uh, you know, quitting your job, but it might be something else. It might be for your past self to be uh, getting some kind of certification that you didn't know was important to you, right? So think about that. Just kind of let yourself, let your mind wander to what might have been something that would make your future self go, oh, thank, thank God my past self did that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and what sort of time scale are we looking at? Are we talking about thinking where where would my past self put me in a year's time, ten years time? What what sort of time frame That's are we looking? That's a great looking? question. And with my clients, it's never something like five or ten years down the line. I'm usually going like six months in the future yeah. or a year in the future. Two years is about as far in the future as I ever ask someone to think um, with my own clients, and that's just because. Yeah we tend to be, you know, ADHD symptom experiencing folk in, in my line of practice. And so that's two years is a long time in the future to think, you know, some of my clients, they're like, I don't even know where I'll be living in two years, right? So how can yeah. I think about the rest of my life? So that makes so much sense. I have done lots of sort of visualization type exercises. And I just cannot see beyond six to 12 months anything beyond right. that feels so far out of reach I there's there is something um in in the ADHD world called object permanence I think it's a misuse of a, yes. a, a different um sort of scientific phenomenon but basically it's kind of out of sight out of mind mm -hmm. and for me, that shows up in things like I can put the washing machine in the wash, uh, the washing in the washing machine, and, <laughs> and because it's in there and I can't see it, it can stay in there for five days because I forget. Yeah. But it, it also shows up, I think, in that sort of longer term, visual visualizing and planning my future because it's so far out of sight. It is, it, and, and I can't, I can't hold it in my head for it to be. Um, something that I could turn into goals. I have to do that on a much yeah, shorter. I can't hold it. There's no, there's no immediate serotonin reward in my future for doing any of those things. Mm -hmm. It's like it's way out there. I can get a quick serotonin hit from eating a piece of chocolate or checking off something on my today's to do list. So. I'm going to do those things instead. Mm -hmm. And, you know, another thing about the timing is that sometimes with a client, what I'll do is I'll get really specific. I'll say like, you know, eight months from now, you know, just to like make it something that's that catches their attention, their imagination so that yeah. they can kind of think about that. And they'll be like, OK, when would that be? That would be uh, July. So, you know, um, and they'll be like, OK, so July, that would be like I'd be at my parents' house. OK, so where would I, you know? They'll, they'll like be able to picture something a little more clearly that way. So, But also that taps into some of the other ADHD traits of things like impulsivity and, you know, risk taking. Mm -hmm. I think if we, if we overthink things, that, that thrill of the, the bit of taking a risk is often lost. So I think if you yeah. keep the, the time scale short, we can tap into that impulse of let's get this done, almost tap into the hyper focus around, okay, what do we need to do to make the next thing happen? Right, let's right. knuckle down and get it done and, and work with those ADHD traits that are often seen as failings. But right. Yeah. Really work for us. Harness our superpowers, right? Because we have a lot of of assets. I mean, just like I talked about with you know, as older women, we have a lot of, uh, of, what would I say? We have a lot of, uh, things in our arsenal that we can use. Right. All those years of experience, that network, that powerful network. My goodness, you know. Um, all the people we know and the people they know and the people those people know. I mean, you look out to your third association network, um, not to mention uh, the ADHD strengths. I mean, you know, 
the the hyper focus, the the imagination, the creativity, the all of these things that you know. And when I say creativity, I don't just mean the ability to paint a picture or write a song. I'm talking about problem solving abilities. I'm talking about thinking outside the box when everybody else is pointed in the same direction at the same whiteboard with the same post-it notes. You're over here thinking, but what if we did this instead? And that's a way better idea. And you just came up with it in two seconds. That's not always an asset in certain environments, but in the right one, you're going to be everybody's best friend. And it certainly is an asset when you're thinking about your own career change, because you want to be able to, you know, work through all of the, the different ideas and the different options of which often we have far too many. And then you need somebody like you, Rachel, to help us narrow them down (laughs) to the ones that are actually going to work. So before, um, before I ask you the final question, um, I'd love to know how people can get in touch with you if they would like to know more about the work that you do. Where can we find you? Yes, you can find me at rachelgaddiscoaching.com. Uh, that's my website. And there's a little thing on there for downloading a free guide, uh, a free like start your career change today guide, because I know how hard it is to get started. So I put together a little guide that's kind of like just three quick steps that'll get you on your path today to starting your career change. Uh, Are you happy for me to link that? Um, yeah, the- yep. I'll give you the link and we can put it in the show notes. Yep. Fabulous. So it's Rachel Gaddis, that's G-A-D-D-I-S, and it's Rachel with, it's A-R-A-C-H-E-L, because there's lots of different ways to help spell Rachel. So um, many, yeah. Brilliant. And are you on LinkedIn, Rachel? I am, you? yep. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, uh, and I just started a Facebook group as well. So if you find me, you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on Facebook, and all of these things will have links to all the other things. So. Uh, what's your Facebook group called? Uh, my Facebook group is called The Reinvention Room. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I'm going to go and um, stalk you over there. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> final question I've just decided to, to start including this since I changed the name of the YouTube channel okay. um, and my question is and I haven't even given you any warning of this so um, oh, I, might, I'm excited. I might give you a, a minute or two to think about it so if you have a if you have to think about it we will just edit a little bit out here but okay. let's get that ADHD fast thinking brain in in play so <laughs> As a Gen Xer, what's the one thing that you think makes this an exceptional generation to have been born in? I think it's the fact that we were, you know, we were unsupervised a good bit when we were growing up. And I think that we, as a result, are quite independent. We're quite okay with uh, doing things on our own, with being by ourselves, with Uh, doing for ourselves, I think it's one of the things that makes us so interesting to follow as we get older uh, and kind of go about in society, start our own businesses, uh, you know, interact with other people. I think it's one of the things that makes us so great. I think it's also one of the things that makes us different from the generations that have come after. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I, I totally get that as well. I think we are a resilient generation yeah yeah we've uh we've we've seen a lot and we're resilient i love that thank you so much for joining me rachel my my us twin across the pond (laughs) whereabouts in the states are you whereabouts are you i'm in virginia northern virginia alexandria just outside of dc very nice very nice well it's been brilliant talking to you good luck with the coaching and uh, we'll talk again soon hopefully yes for sure bye Bye bye-bye